appendicitis. Holy grail, right? This is one of those um, areas for point of care ultrasound in the pediatric emergency department that generates a lot of uh, debate and controversy and we'll go through some of the pros and the cons of doing it. It's one of those things that people at the beginning are like, oh, imagine if I could do that. Um, and the point at which you become confident in doing it is somewhere usually years down the line, but confident in terms of you feel like your rule in and rule out abilities are pretty good. You'll find early on you have the ability to put a probe on a kid with a pretty good story and often see uh, clear evidence of appendicitis. I mean, maybe no more so than your history and physical exam have just given you for that patient, but there are a number of cases where it's like, ah, the rule in capability is, is easy. So this is the thing we're talking about, right? Uh, and we're going to talk in this um, lecture about why it's hard to find, uh, why it's hard to visualize, and about one of the things that's hardest at the beginning. So everywhere else where we're scanning, it's like you go and you look at the lung surface, you go and you look at the heart, you go and you look at the nodes in the neck. You don't struggle to look at them because you're trying to push a whole bunch of st other stuff out of the way, right? Um, and in doing appendix ultrasound, you have to know what is this bowel going to look like? What's this large intestine and cecum going to look like? What's the small intestine around it going to look like at a normal state? And then you have to train your brain to erase that when you're looking at the screen and you're hunting for just this thing, which in a lot of its normal or abnormal states can look a lot like this thing. So when we talk about... Um, intestinal contents, uh, looking in the right lower quadrant, this would be like a representative kind of shot that seems like just a bunch of nothing <coughs> when you're starting out. Um, I'll tell you when I look at this after some time doing it, I know we're right over in the right uh, side where the abdomen dives off to the flank. And I know that because if I look at the peritoneal lining here, I can see it make this 90 degree turn and drop down to its border. I know we're a little bit high because we've got the liver starting to peak in here in the second half of the shot. And so that helps me with some orientation. I'm expecting to find the large intestine and I'm expecting the large intestine, the ascending colon on the side of the body to have a different appearance than small intestine, uh, which is all based around water, right? And the properties of water with ultrasound. Ultrasound encountering water will propagate through. Uh, water allows the beam to transduce further into the body until it hits another reflective surface and bounces off. And what happens to intestinal contents as they go from the small intestine to the large intestine? Water gets absorbed, right? So in your small intestine, you're often able to view the whole intestine and be like, here's the front wall, here's the contents, here's the back wall. Whereas in the large intestine, when a bunch of that water content is gone and you're now getting a rocky poop, you start to get just shadowing, stuff that looks more like just pure artifact. So that's the difference between the small intestinal loops here, and you see that they have stool or material that's becoming stool within them, and those small intestinal loops are pushed up against air and shadowing solid material here in the arch, the anterior arch of the uh, ascending colon. And we've got a little bit of spine with some overlying vessels that peaks in at the end over here. We've got probably the end of the psoas muscle that peaks in down there. Doing strong compression uh, bowel sonography is really like you're displacing bowel everywhere and you'll often bring the spine, you'll bring the psoas right up against the peritoneum. Uh, and recognizing the spine and psoas are things that will take some practice but are totally doable. So what do you guys think this is an image of. Yeah. So I've still got my probe in a transverse orientation. I'm over in the right flank. I'm about mid abdomen, not lower quadrant, not upper quadrant. And you've got this one continual signal here. It's not interrupted by a line coming down or anything. It just curves like this with some of that artifact that we're used to seeing from air, some dirty shadowing. So this is what 
the anterior wall of the ascending colon looks like. The colon actually, you know, has walls that come down here and they loop around like that and it's like a big oval. But you only see the anterior surface and the artifacts that the stool within produces. Okay, so now if we want to think more about the small intestine and what that might look like, Greg brought up this kind of uh, analogy on this last talk. So when you're compressing small bowel that isn't currently full of material that's just being digested, it ends up looking a lot like this kind of kid's maze. You know, you push wall upon wall together. Underneath that's another wall upon wall that you're pushing together, and it just looks like this collapsed maze, which is uh, what we're showing here. So just wall upon wall, wall upon wall. There's not much in terms of content. There's just walls being swished down upon each other. A little bit of air signal down there. We're over in the patient's left side here. That could be a sigmoid colon coming down behind. And so this is what, when you're able to displace the content out of small intestinal loops, that's what it'll look like. And the psoas is the big landmark when you're doing your right lower quadrant scans. We spend most of our time scanning in a transverse orientation. And you're going to have this big piece of steak that comes up, this big sirloin that's going to sit there that you're able to smush all of the intestinal walls, either to uh, this side, to the kind of pericolic gutter over there, or you're able to squish it medially. And then in this diagram, which would be a diagram from an adult, because you can see the amount of mesenteric fat that they're showing in this representation. It's all the white stuff around your iliac vessels. So compression. If we're trying to get that um, view of the psoas, if we're trying to use it as our landmark, and we're using it as a selection tool as a bimanual palpation kind of tool. We're trying to uh, squish everything out of the way so we can find the appendix. The appendix um, often runs over the psoas, but not always. And if it does, then you're either going to have a normal appendix, squish everything out of the way and be left with this tiny little dot of a structure that you trace out and you say, well, that looks like it's a finger like projection with a blind end. Or even more useful, if you have appendicitis, one of the uh, things you have with your appendix then, one of the definitions of the appendix with appendicitis is that the inflamed area is non-compressible. So you'll have this six millimeter or more structure that you cannot compress anymore, but you've got to use that so as to compress it. And if you're not compressing, um, you've got to be a little bit cruel to be kind teachings that uh, I have for my trainees. If you're trying to be really, really nice to this patient and you're not compressing at all, you're going to get views like this. So I can't really tell you where we are, what's going on here. I mean, maybe that's the aorta. I don't know. Uh, telling you anything about bowel is tough. You need to get all this stuff out of the way using compression to get that nice view of the stuff lying deep to it. So this is what that view turns into if you use compressions. So you're actually pushing with some firmness here. And you can see how now, oh, this is obviously a psoas. And you can see this fascicle of fat on the inside, which is this fascicle of fat here. Uh, the internal structures of the psoas sometimes confuse people at the start because they're thinking maybe this is compressed bowel and this is something within the bowel. Is that a nerve? Or, but this is all just the psoas muscle here. Uh, and then this is the terminal ilium over here, which you can tell. Uh, might trick you into thinking it's the appendix. One of the greatest challenges in doing this is distinguishing terminal ilium from an appendix. And that's just the example of um, what is going on with this right white center. When we think about a big piece of muscle like the psoas, think about a big piece of muscle like a steak and it begins to make sense why things have that kind of internal appearance. <laughs>